Today's webinar will be presented by Dr. Jim Dooley, who is the co-founder and chief technology officer of Forest Concepts, LLC, located in Auburn, Washington. Dr. Dooley has built his career by combining a deep understanding of plant biology with disciplined engineering, design, and business development to create innovative products, processes, and equipment. Jim previously held a number of engineering, technical management, and business development positions with warehouser company in the timber industry and with AMFAC Agricultural Group in the sugarcane and tropical fruit industries. His bioenergy work is currently in its fifth iteration following the cycles of energy crises in America. Current developments by Forest Concepts are reducing the energy intensity for comminution and drying, as well as new methods to collect and deliver biomass from fields to centralized depots and processing sites. He will be elaborating on some of this work in his presentation today. So welcome, Jim. We're very pleased to be joining you. Thank you, Sarah. Uh, to everybody, thanks for joining the webinar. Uh, we have, looks like a fairly good turnout today. Uh, thanks, and Michelle, you get the gold star for being the first to log in as a participant. Uh, and hopefully you all can uh, follow along with me uh, with the PowerPoint as I go through this. We're going to have a little video in the middle uh, that Sarah will run for you. But the idea of high density baling of biomass is something that Forest Concepts started working on in 2005, actually 10 years ago this month, uh, under funding from USDA SBIR program. And over the time from then to now, uh, we started with collecting urban biomass as an alternative to chipping, then went to uh, high density baling of agricultural crops like switchgrass. And today are working under a US Department of Energy project uh, on baling of forest residuals. So I think it's fairly timely that we do this webinar uh, to bring the rest of you up to speed on what we're doing and the potential for rails. Little roadmap, uh, talk a little bit about forest concepts beyond what Sarah gave us in the intro the continuum from biomass to feedstocks, uh, why bills make sense. And then getting into a little bit of engineering uh, that describes the concepts behind design of biomass balers, whether you're working with switchgrass or woody crops, and then open it to discussion at the end. Forest Concepts is a company, myself and three other former warehouse people created in 1998. Today we have 10 full-time regular employees, about half are engineers, uh, with fairly broad backgrounds uh, in everything from agricultural and biological engineering to mechanical and aeronautical. We're based in Auburn, Washington, which is a suburb of Seattle. Uh, we work with a global network of collaborators at other companies, universities, and federal labs. At heart, we're a technology developer at the intersection of biology, energy, engineering, and enterprise. Uh, we work in three primary business arenas. Uh, bioenergy is a major emphasis today. Uh, we developed what's known as crumbles feedstocks. Uh, today we're talking about baling work. Uh, beneficiation is a fancy word from the coal industry for cleaning, but we do a lot of work on cleaning up dirty feedstocks. And then precision feedstocks is really creating feedstock materials from biomass that are optimized for various conversion platforms. We started our company in the environmental restoration area. Elwood is an engineered habitat material for threatened and endangered species, salmon and upland habitat restoration. And then we developed wood straw, which is a wood strand erosion control material. And that was really our, our introduction to baling of wood fiber materials. Everything we do is intended to be implemented at community scale. To us, there's this continuum from biomass to feedstock. Uh, I use those terms differently and will through this talk today. You know, biomass is really green stuff on the hoof. Uh, as you can see on the left side of this, uh, piles of thinnings, uh, wildfire protection thinnings from around homes, uh, park prunings, uh, what have you. 
uh, and then uh, potentially biomass is even bales of switchgrass and bales of corn stover and that kind of thing. But as you start to process that that form, uh, you get closer and closer to feedstock, and ultimately at the right side of this photo story, uh, you've got the kinds of materials that go into reactors to create second generation biofuels. Bailing addresses one of the critical issues that everybody faces with biomass. And that is that loose biomass, as you can see on the roadside here in Lake Tahoe, uh, or in a thinning project around some homes in eastern Washington, uh, is very loose. It has a bulk density of two or three, perhaps four pounds per cubic foot. It's very difficult to handle. And if you bale it, Instead of chip it, you get it into a form that's handleable just like every other recyclable in the urban centers. So you, everybody understands and knows that there's uh, cardboard, tin cans, uh, newspaper is bailed uh, to simplify the collection, logistics, and processing of urban recyclables. And what we started out to do in 2005 was to figure out how to bail woody biomass uh, in urban centers as an alternative chippers to allow biomass to be collected and handled, transported, just like other urban recyclables. If you process biomass uh, at the source or, or roadside, today in the urban centers in most suburban areas, it's done with chippers. Uh, chippers are increasingly banned in communities due to noise and dust uh, in the Seattle area, the major infrastructure pruning company uh, figures that about 30% of their project sites um, have regulations that prevent them from using chippers on streets in residential areas and near schools. That material has to be hauled in bulk. And so if we could bail it, not only do we simplify the logistics, but we reduce that noise and dust uh, and from a life cycle analysis, as we'll talk about later, uh, you minimize the use of fossil energy. Bailing, as we all know, from agriculture and from recycling, enables handling of materials with forklifts and shipping with conventional trucks, uh, just like other recyclables, hay crops, and other dedicated energy crops. We chose rectangular bales as our form, uh, primarily to allow hauling on conventional flatbed trucks and in vans. Bailing allows us to process feedstocks uh, at the destination or at an industrial feedstock firm. Uh, increasingly, the biofuel energy industry is moving to sourcing feedstocks ready to go into the reactor rather than doing processing themselves. What we have here uh, on the left is a pile that came from one of our bales. Uh, those of you that have got a high resolution monitor can probably see a few little blue fluffy things in there and that's from the twine that was around the bale. And on the right we have a power plant grinder uh, in eastern Washington that is processing a bale. One of the nice things about bales that are designed concurrently with the grinding equipment is that the bales don't need to be broken up or anything before they go into the grinders. Sarah, if you could run the video for us. This video will give you an introduction to baling in real life.
idea of of the size and scale of creating biomass bales, particularly in this case, woody biomass bales. But just things you should have been able to notice from the video is that biomass baling uh, creates high density. Uh, high density reduces storage space, uh, increases transport payloads, whether you're hauling with truck, rail, or barge. Uh, and we found that it enables more efficient grinding in horizontal grinders in particular, but also in tub grinders that are used by some companies. Rectangular bales as opposed to round bales uh, were chosen by us because they handle just like other baled recyclables in urban centers. Uh, they allow use of conventional agricultural bale handling equipment, squeezes, conveyors, bale breakers, and that sort of thing. And we believe that rectangular bills create safer stacks. Just to show that we're not all wood, uh, here's a picture of a high density switchgrass bale uh, with Chris Lanning, one of our development engineers running the baler. Uh, this switchgrass came to us from University of Nebraska Ag Research Service. Uh, was shipped to us as round bales. We unrolled them on the floor. Uh, by getting round bales, the material was pretty much intact. It had not been chopped or sheared like it would in a conventional rectangular baler. So in this case, we took data from our research baler, which makes about a 1.5 cubic foot bale, and then use that data to set the controls in our engineering prototype baler. And in this case, made a bale that was somewhere between 20 and 22 pounds per cubic foot. And for those of you that have experience with switchgrass and some of the other dedicated energy crops know that bale density is a big problem. Um, and conventional hay balers typically can bale switchgrass, you used to be able to bale switchgrass certainly in the eight or nine pounds per cubic foot range. Uh, the new higher density balers from CNH and AGCO are up in the 10 or 11 uh, pounds per cubic foot, which is a significant advancement, but still su substantially lower than what you see as a light green bar across this uh, chart. Around 15 pounds per cubic foot is what it takes to hit payload and cube on a flatbed truck in most states in the U.S. So if you think about an eight foot wide, 48 foot long trailer stacked eight or nine feet tall to hit street legal payload, uh, you need to get bales to about 15 pounds per cubic foot. And baling is something for hay that started in the 1870s or 1880s, and that's really looking at the left of this. You see loose straw. If you pile a hay wagon with just pitchforks of loose straw, you know, it'd be two or three pounds per cubic foot at the most. Um, loose hay or switchgrass is a little denser, but still very low. Conventional switchgrass bales were up around 10, as I said. Conventional straw bales are, because straw and hay are more compressible than switchgrass, uh, you can get up in the 12, 13 pounds per cubic foot and start to approach street legal payloads, but you often see hay trucks going down the highway uh, with bales extending over the edges, uh, the back of the load, or with special trailer designs in order to get more cube on the truck. High density switchgrass bales that we've been working towards uh, you know, are really of two forms. One we call high density switchgrass bales that are about 20 pounds per cubic foot like you saw in the previous picture. And then an ultra high density switchgrass bale that could be up around 25. Some work we've been doing here in the West on biofuel feedstock transport in the Western context where the di transportation distances average 150 to 175 miles rather than 20 or 30 miles. Uh, ultra high density makes a lot of sense. The ultra high density uh, material also greatly reduces the size of a bale yard. If you think about a bale yard, 
the new Abengoa or Poet facility being something like 40 acres, if you could double the amount of material in that yard or ideally reduce the size of that yard by half, there's significant savings. So when we look at woody biomass, which is really what, what you saw in the video, uh, this bale uh, that Tom Broderick is standing next to is from tree service prunings uh, on power line maintenance projects here in the Seattle area. Uh, is a bale that's about the same size as a large hay bale uh, and weighs roughly one green ton. That is about 40 or 50 percent moisture, so there's just over a half a ton on an oven dry basis of biomass. I see Tim Volk asked a question about deploying this on power line right of ways. Uh, anticipating that, Tim, this, uh, this bale is from power line right of way prunings. Bulk density also matters with woody biomass. Uh, unlike the chart we showed two slides ago of the agricultural commodities, when you start with forestry materials, woody biomass starts out really dense. A uh, truckload of logs is 35, 36 pounds per cubic foot, which is why truckloads of logs uh, use special design trucks, but you don't see those trucks piled really, really high. The veneer industry uh, takes logs and peels that into sheets uh, to make plywood, fiberboard, and other commodities out of. When you peel logs into veneer and then stack that veneer, you get the bulk density up over 50 pounds per cubic foot, which is, you know, the solid um, wet green moisture bulk density of, of wood. And you never see a veneer truck going down the, the road full because it'll always hit payload before it hits density. But once you start to chop up logs or veneer uh, or forest residuals into chips, you immediately take that bulk density down below uh, the ideal uh, transportation density. So wood chips are 13, anywhere from 13 to 14 pounds per cubic foot, which is why chip vans tend to be very specialized trailers with a high cube that maximizes the volumetric payload in an attempt to get towards uh, highway legal payload. Sawdust from Mills is actually is even lower density. Um, ground hog fuel, hog fuel to those of you that aren't familiar is the residuals. So if I take the trim off of two by fours and the bark and the roundup and I run it through a grinder, that's called hog fuel. Um, is again, it's in the 10 to 12 pounds per cubic foot range and requires specialized trailers to haul. The work we're doing currently under funding from Department of Energy through a Biomass Research and Development Initiative project led by Humboldt State University is trying to solve the very difficult problem of loose forest residuals. So forest residuals is what's left over after logging. So the loggers take out the logs, which you see in the left-hand bar. They often take out the poles, uh, which are from the tops, which are small diameter pieces of wood. Those can be hauled out as poles uh, at fairly high density. But then you're left with the branches. And the, and the branches and, and the very tip-top material is very much like uh, urban biomass to us, except that it's in much bigger piles and much more scattered across the landscape. And that material naturally is, is only about three or four pounds per cubic foot density. So. We started under USDA funding, as I said earlier, in 2005 to look at how we could take this woody biomass uh, and create bales that met highway legal transportation density. Because the material's green when it's um, harvested and green when it's baled, we found that if we can bale up in the 21 or 22 pounds per cubic foot range, that the bales have enough porosity and airflow through the bales that they can naturally dry down into the 15 to 17 pounds per cubic foot if they're, if they're held in a very open stack for two or three weeks in most conditions. So our initial baler in 2005-2007 was designed to bale up to the 22 to 25 pounds per cubic foot green basis with the expectation that we would dry down. 
It also would bale dry materials, as you saw in one piece of the video clip, uh, to the 15 to 16 pounds per cubic foot needed if you did bale dry materials. Today we're working with the NARA project here in the West and, and through this birdie to b create bales that are up in the 30 pounds per cubic foot for specialized short haul transport on private roads. Um, that's not really what we're focused on here today. Um, but you can also see just for reference at the right that wood pellets, which is the commodity feedstock, uh, why, do, why do you invest in the energy and everything to make pellets? It's, it's really to get this 40 pound per cubic foot transport density, which is what's needed to meet the international market for pellets, but is much higher than what you need for transportation in the U.S. Uh, Michael asked question is uh, highway legal payload 25 tons. Uh, that's a good general number. Uh, is it the same in all states? It's not the same in all states. Uh, here in the northwest, northern Cal or Oregon, Washington, Idaho, Montana, we have a compact that allows us to haul up to about 35 tons on highways. Other states are down in the 20 to 22 ton range. So it's not the same in all states. Um, so going on design of a baler, um, there's a few engineering things. Uh, you know, I doubt that very many of you on the audience are engineers, so, so here's your engineering lesson. Uh, engineering uh, of a baler for us starts with building models in computers uh, and doing a lot of numerical analysis. And, and that if you're designing a baler, uh, whether it's switchgrass or wood uh, that you're attempting to bale, there's really three engineering factors. One is compressibility, uh, which is the pressure that you put. Uh, so you think about a garbage compactor, you think about the garbage truck that's coming down your street and picking up uh, your trash it each week. That's got a a big platen or compression system in it. And so the, the first factor is compressibility, which is really the springiness. One of the things we've learned, uh, as well as others have learned, is that switchgrass is a lot springier than Timothy Hay and some of the historic materials that are baled, which is why, in large part, switchgrass is very difficult to make high density bales with conventional balers. The second factor is plasticity. And plasticity is, is a property of biological materials uh, that says that when I push on it, it, it deforms. Uh, and so if I take sticks, a bunch of wet green sticks, and I press them across each other, they're going to tend to bend across each other and press into the voids or the open spaces between particles. And, and so the first bit of effort goes to compress the material down until all the pieces are in touch with each other and then you continue to press with more force and you get plastic deformation which is an engineering term it's an annealing process uh, where the part particles or the sticks or the stalks bend and, and conform with each other to sort of deflect and fill into the empty spaces then there's a third really interesting force and that's called Poisson's effects. And Henri Poisson discovered these in the 1860s. And that is whether it's biomass or steel or a rubber eraser. When you push on it, um, it tends to press out on the side. So you think about a water balloon. And if I stuck a water balloon inside of this baler and pressed on it, as I push on the edges, it's also trying to push out against the sides. And it turns out that in biomass materials that these Poisson's effects can be the thing that break balers apart. And those of us that have been around for 15 years or so in this space know that early attempts to use conventional ag builders on switchgrass um, broke welds and, and people said they'd blow the builders up. And typically that was a Poisson effect because switchgrass has a significantly higher side pressure or Poisson's force than uh, most hay has. And we found that woody biomass, even if you take a whole um, big clamp full of brush and prunings from a power line company 
and stick that in a baler that you also get some fairly significant side forces that come out of that. So there's your engineering lesson for the day. This platen pressure versus bale density uh, is a standard metric uh, used throughout the industry. You see this in the literature. Um, this is a little bit messy uh, curve because it's an artifact of some data that we did looking at the effect of moisture content. Again, greener material uh, has higher plasticity uh, and lower spring force. Dry material has higher spring force and less plasticity. Uh, and then we've got on here a curve for Timothy Hay, which is kind of the standard in the bailing industry. Uh, and Timothy Hay is, is the line that goes up the steepest, fastest uh, on this. So you've got bale density on the left axis and pressure against the material inside the bailing chamber across the x-axis. So on the y-axis you can see that the Timothy Hay goes up. You don't have to push on it very hard to get a fairly dense bale. Switchgrass on the other hand follows this kind of interesting curve that's the fuzzy gray line across the middle that crosses everything else and, and that again anybody that's worked with switchgrass out there knows that switchgrass is really weird to bale. Uh, and this, is, this helps show some of why it's different than other materials. Um, Timothy Hay has this characteristic, it's called an S-curve. Uh, those of you from Penn State may remember Nuri Mosinen. Uh, he was kind of the father of these physical properties of biomaterials. Uh, and that this is a classic curve that Mosinen developed back in the 60s. Um, for biomaterials, and we find that it works on bailing of biomass today as well. Then the whole group of curves that, that are in the middle of the graph are different woody biomass at different moisture contents. And they're very much what you would expect. They are an S-shaped curve. That S-shape instead of a linear curve is because of the combination of both springiness and plasticity drives that characteristic shape. But in this case, we were able to produce bales that were um, with high moisture materials that were in excess of 30 pounds per cubic foot. For those of you interested in life cycle analysis, uh, bailing to high densities uh, has a negative effect uh, on life cycle fossil fuel consumption compared to bailing to low densities. Uh, and in some cases even more fuel consumed uh, to make very high density bales in the field than is used for gr some grinders like horizontal grinders. So bailing to high densities increases fossil fuel consumption uh, out in the field compared to conventional low density bailing. Uh, higher density bailing reduces the fossil fuel consumption though for trucking, handling, and storage. If I can reduce the size of the bale yard by a half or a third uh, that saves a lot of fuel in the on-site handling. The closer I can get to full legal payload on trucking, the more efficient those trucks are. Fuel consumption is more related to mileage than payload. And then finally, bailing enables grinding with electric grinders um, at or near the point of use. And that electric grinders can either use parasitic power if it's a power plant or grid power sources otherwise. Um, both of which have lower life cycle implications. So we're getting near the end here. Uh, why bale? It's a readily understood system. Uh, baling biomass is similar to baling of other recyclable materials and virtually identical to baling of agricultural commodities, uh, except for these physical properties that drive different force relationships. Uh, bailing enables shipping by conventional flatbed trucks and rail. Uh, it maximizes payload. Uh, balers can be designed uh, to minimize the energy consumption and maximize payload in, in particular watersheds or supply sheds or states or counties, uh, whatever you're trying to optimize for. Bailing maximizes storage density, and as we're getting these first pioneer second generation biofuel facilities up and running, uh, the size of the bale yards and storage density is being discovered as a major cost factor, uh, major uh, 
consumer of land um, and major effect on the footprint for the facility. So, so maximizing storage density wasn't a big deal five years ago. And in the last six or eight months, it's come on the, on the horizon as a big factor. Um, Bailing reduces receiver handling costs, particularly compared to chips, uh, because it's a discrete bail material with conventional equipment rather than a bulk handling, piling, depiling, front end loader problem. Bailing often will increase the supply radius for biomass users. So you can haul bales um, 50 or 100 miles where it's very rare that you haul wood chips more than about 25 miles. And in urban centers, uh, bailing is very attractive because it's quieter and less dusty than chipping. So with that, I'm going to end uh, a couple minutes early from when I set out to get done, so that's good. Uh, I'd like to thank you for your attention uh, and open it to questions. Sarah, do you want to start by looking down through the questions here and pick a couple? Sure. Yeah, I think um, you addressed most of the questions that were brought up during the presentation, but I wanted to point out one of the comments that uh, that Tim Volk made about the video. Um, you know, he mentions that there's, you know, it stops from time to time, which, uh, you know, he notes is a good representation of what it's like to work on a developing technology in the field. Um, it's never entirely smooth the first time out. Um, and you know it takes some takes some figuring out. So do you want to talk a little bit about the process of use and and kind of what that looks like on the ground? Okay, <laughs> the the baler that you saw in the video was an engineering prototype for a chipper re what we call chipper replacement video or chipper replacement baler. Uh, in the United States, there's roughly 40,000 tow behind chippers in use. Uh, tow behind chippers are the ones you see parks departments, landscapers, uh, power line pruning companies. Uh, there's, they're essentially everywhere. There's 10 or 12 major manufacturers of tow behind chippers in North America. Uh, and, and a typical chipper crew produces anywhere from 500 pounds to three or four tons of chips a day. Uh, major power line infrastructure pruning crew will produce typically three or four tons of chips a day. So that's very difficult to get rid of. It's very difficult to aggregate into 20 or 25 ton payloads uh, to haul to biomass users. So the baler that we put together initially in the one in the video runs on about a 30 horsepower engine because that's all it takes to keep up with a power line maintenance or a parks department maintenance crew. Uh, what you see here in the upper left of this uh, final slide is a set of bales from our local city of Auburn parks department where they collected all of the brush from the city parks for a month and we turned all of that into nine bales. So in an entire month, they only collected nine bales worth of material. So relatively low horsepower, low productivity uh, is the name of the game with these kinds of balers until you get to the forestry application we're working on now. But the market uh, in the US is, is roughly um, 35 to 40 million tons a year of urban woody biomass. The Western Governors Association in 2005 uh, put out a report that showed that there was about 10 million tons in the nine western states of woody biomass in the urban centers that had tipping fees associated with it. Uh, and the reason that even going from 2005 to today that that material is not being used for biopower and second generation biofuels is the cost of collecting and transporting and aggregating that is just too high uh, compared to putting in compost facilities or landfills. Okay, so yeah, so the I think you already addressed a couple of the next questions coming. Um, you know, Mike points out the the trade off of a potential bottleneck in terms of timing and and time to bail uh, a certain amount of material versus the the time it takes to bring the material to the baler and and sort of keep that square with all of the other logistics. So it seems like from what you're saying, um, that might become a problem in a, in a forestry landing type scenario but maybe you see a good niche for this kind of thing in urban settings? 
Correct. The, the, the big niche is, is to get at very distributed, low-volume sources. Uh, so the urban centers, uh, we've done a lot of work with waste management and allied waste. Uh, two years, two or three years ago, we bailed Christmas trees. Uh, and in the United States, we use something like seven or eight million live Christmas trees a year. Uh, and everybody says that that'd be a great biofuel source if we could only figure out how to get them from those seven or eight million houses and condominiums and apartments to where the power plants are. So those kinds of places are where bailing makes initial sense. Uh, most of that material you're going to have to pay to get rid of anyhow, so it's available at zero or negative cost. Uh, and and you need a baler there that keeps up with the collection system, so it keeps up with the hand crew or it keeps up with the route trucks going down the street. Um, so if, I'll take the, yeah, let's just jump, I'll go ahead and read ahead of you here. Uh, Edward asked about what drives the hydraulics, electricity, or internal combustion engine. In our baler, we have an internal combustion engine. Uh, our current prototype baler that you saw in the video uh, had a 30 horsepower gasoline engine on it. Uh, the commercial version will probably have about a 40 horsepower diesel engine on it. Um, and that's just because it's compatible with the other equipment used by those same contractors. Thanks. So, so pretty manageable scale, um, especially if you're you're navigating urban settings. Who do you see as the the primary buyers and users of this uh, this thing are? Um, you know, would it? You mentioned parks departments. Would that be something that um, you know a manager of a park would want to have um, as part of their uh, you know machine machine shop area, um, or is that something that you know maybe arborists or urban foresters um, who run operations that do removals would would want to have? Um, who are the ultimate buyers of this kind of thing, and, and who does it make the most sense for? Good question. The ultimate buyers uh, initially are landscape contractors, vegetation management firms that currently operate fleets of chippers. Uh, Asplen Tree Service is the largest tree service company in North America. Currently has some something on the order of 4,000 crews. Uh, they produce about 2 million tons of wood chips a year. Uh, and so they're obviously a place where it makes sense. And if you could get the kinds of material they're doing, uh, they're collecting as a public service uh, from the power lines and right of ways that they manage uh, to biopower into second generation biofuels, it'll be a big deal. Uh, but when you get down to an individual park or golf course, uh, there's an interesting question is, is do you need a mobile baler uh, or a fixed baler, uh, some of the launch models that we've envisioned are on roll-off skids, um, sort of the same footprint as a small dumpster, so that they can be electrically powered, plugged in, and, and support a maintenance crew that's maintaining a golf course or a park. But we've also found that in many cases, uh, those same park managers will collect their brush into a pile and then they contract with somebody to come make it disappear. Uh, so there'll be a service business that evolves. And then finally there's producers just like in the cardboard recycling baling business that uh, there'll be aggregators that own the balers and then lease those to producers. Uh, some of the work we did in the city of Chicago a few years ago suggested that was a model that they preferred for their parks and green, green belts. Uh, that a service firm will take ownership of the biomass uh, and provide the balers as a vehicle to get the biomass. And it's very much like the cardboard balers at the back of Walmart or Safeway or Kroger or Giant Tea Store. Is, is that those balers are rarely owned by the waste producer. They're almost always owned by the collection firm. Thanks. Um, you mentioned that, that chipping is, is being increasingly more difficult in urban settings due to noise pollution, ordinances, and things like that. Um, so, so these uh, tree services that, that do management of urban woody biomass waste, 
um, are they are they just using conventional balers right now? What is their method for for moving material around? If not the use, using something like this high density baler, as vegetation management companies get constrained by local ordinances for dust, uh, dust in many parts of the West and, and noise almost every community. Uh, in the Seattle area, we have noise ordinances that prevent preclude using chippers within a thousand feet of an elementary school, for example. So today, the, the solution to that is to have the ground crew or the hand crew just load the material in a roll-off container, uh, dumpster or even a dump truck uh, at two or three pounds per cubic foot and then haul it to a location, typically a gravel pit uh, for collection, aggregating, and grinding. Uh, that takes the, their disposal costs from 15 or $20 a ton if they were able to chip it and then dump those chips for free somewhere uh, to 75 or $80 a ton. So it doubles or triples their disposal cost when they can't use chippers today. I imagine we're currently, go ahead, we're currently working towards commercializing this. So the, the balers that you saw in the video aren't ready for sale yet today. Um, we're working towards that point as fast as we can. If their processing costs are 70 to $80 a ton, I imagine it'd be hard to find markets that would pay a lot more than that to, so they could at least break even. That's a great question. Uh, and the problem with all of these biomass, waste biomass sources is that the cost of handling has to be borne as, as a cost of waste disposal. And what we need to do with bailing or anything else we do in the supply chain on that is to minimize the incremental cost. So in the case of this urban biomass uh, here in the Seattle area, if you take it to a compost facility, you'll pay in not only the cost of collecting it and hauling it, but you'll pay 35 to 45 dollars a green ton to dump it. Uh, and so tipping fees uh, are the big carrot uh, to drive people to bailing or other ways to get into biofuel because what they're doing is avoiding paying tipping fees. And so that avoided cost uh, can make it at a much more reasonable cost to a biofuel plant. But the economics are never going to be positive on a standalone from any of our calculations. Yeah, it seems like, you know, biofuels are, the, our favorite quote is that every five years, it's always five years away, right? So, um, you know, with the understanding that that's not a major market, there aren't, um, you know, a distributed set of biofuels plants across the, the U.S., certainly more now than there used to be, but it's still not a, you know, broad scale uh, consumer for material like this. You mentioned compost. I, I wonder if you could talk about um, the major, wh what the main markets are for this material if it's going to be avoided as a waste management product and find some other use. Okay, first I'm going to challenge your question, your, your assertion that biomass, bioenergy is always five years out. Uh, today is for real. <laughs> yeah, it is a joke, but I want to make sure that the joke doesn't promulgate misimpressions, but sure. today, you know, we have Poets facility in Emmonsburg, Iowa running. Uh, Abengo is starting up, DuPont starting up. And, and so we have real biofuels, second generation biofuels uh, being produced today. Uh, the next increments are uh, under construction uh, for agricultural commodity feedstocks, but the the other ones that really fit directly to this conversation are are those that are looking at urban waste because our urban waste are a humongous resource in North America. And so we have Ineos in Florida, uh, which is gasifying urban waste, prunings from orchards and, and groves, and, and then reforming that gas into liquid fuels. Uh, Fulgrim, uh, is another waste to biofuel company. Fulgrim just signed a big offtake agreement on aviation biofuels. So uh, waste to biofuels is also for real uh, with Enios in operation and others under construction. Uh, so the, 
the real drive is is to demonstrate as USDA supported us to do starting in 2005 and now DOE that that you can cost efficiently collect these materials as an alternative chips uh, get them into truckload quantities get them delivered 50 or 100 or 150 miles to biofuel plants and, and today the market is biopower uh, all of the bales we've produced in all of our demonstrations have gone to biopower uh, as an alternative to chips so they're ground into fuel for power plants um, but those power plants tend to be large and out in the country and and the next generation biofuels that are based on waste streams will be closer to the urban centers and, and so bailing is going to make more and more sense over time and this really anticipates that trend yeah so, so those are chipped uh, upon delivery for incorporation into uh, either co-firing or, or sole uh, biomass firing operations correct they're they're chipped or ground uh, at the point of use or adjacent to the point of use yeah. Looks thanks. like we've only got a couple more minutes. Yeah. Is. yeah. I'm, I'm glad you took. I'm glad you took that direction uh, in answering my comment. I was really hoping you would you would go that way and, and dispel that very popular uh, thing we like to say in a kind of self-deprecating way. But actually, you know, there is a lot of progress. And um, yeah, I'm glad. No. Acknowledged. Um, so. Uh, the, it seems I'm glad you brought up gasification because um, it seems like you know a lot of the um, urban settings that you're talking about um, it, apart from biofuels uh, park managers or tree services that are in that kind of setting are often really um, really linked in pretty close with municipal waste or, or, or municipal power sources or, or community-based kind of operations and it seems like um, gasification is one place where um, cities attempt to take some control over their own power generation and if they you know if they're already integrated with a kind of waste management system for uh, for woody biomass in their own cities that seems like a really good opportunity um, to put those two things together that that's exactly right uh, again this this picture at the upper left I, I keep coming back to uh, that's from again city of Auburn here uh, this this group of bales were produced at the bottom of the depression recession uh, that we just came in out coming out of in the US but the mayor of Auburn has been a big supporter of our development and that even in the depths of that recession the city council continued to tell him to buy green power credits so city of Auburn all of their municipal buildings run on green power from produced from biopower plants and one particular plants only about 80 miles away and so we bailed all this material plus everything else they produce for a three-month period and then with the power plant used backhauls uh, of trucks that were hauling wood products and other things from that community to Seattle to back all the baled biomass that biomass then went through power and came back to city of Auburn as green power and in the state of the city address the uh, the mayor uh, was able to say that not only did they buy green power but the green power they were buying was produced in part by the woody biomass produced by the road maintenance department the parks department and that reduced their cost of disposal of all that material by more than what they were paying as premium for the green power so closing that loop was really important to the citizens of our town yeah that's a great example and it seems like you know it seems like regardless of um, what other energy markets are doing, what gas prices are, what, uh, what fuel oil prices are, that there seems to be this really good niche for, um, for biomass and biopower specifically at institutional or community scales. So, I'm, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm glad you brought up that example. It's, it's, it's a good one to, to publicize widely and talk about because it seems like this, this constant is always true, that there's always that uh, niche opportunity in there. Yeah, that you know the challenge there's other people probably on this call that know the conversion pathways better than I do but uh, the ability to downscale to community scale uh, talk we gave on bailing 
in Vancouver, British Columbia a few years ago, a woman in the audience says, well, it'd be really awesome if I could drop off the prunings from a rhododendron bushes on the, at the recycling plant and then drive down the street to the gas station and, and know that the E85 was made out of the prunings I dropped off a few weeks ago. Uh, and so one of the challenges we have in opportunities in, in advanced biofuels is to solve the downscaling question uh, so that we can reduce the transportation distances and minimize the environmental impact so that we can locate these conversion facilities to liquid fuels or heat and power uh, right in the communities that benefit from it. Sure. And in addition, you know, it, you take something that was uh, previously a very abstract concept and you bring it down to, to personal experience and, and that's kind of that's how uh, a lot of these technologies really gain a lot of support in communities too. So that's um, that's a good note. Uh, we have another. Yeah David, jo yeah, David Jones just popped in with a quest comment that it seems like this should work for universities as well as municipalities. Certainly, we you know, increasing number of universities have biomass power plant. Uh, University of Minnesota. Whoa, I just lost my screen. Oh, it's back. Uh, University of Minnesota has uh, biomass power at Tri Cities campus. Uh, you know, University of Idaho is almost exclusively runs on biopower. They've had wood chip biomass power for decades there, but we see uh, cogeneration more and more. Uh, the opportunity, he, you know, with universities or municipalities, is capture prunings during the winter. Uh, stockpile that in bale yards and, and then use that winter harvested material or storm debris uh, to fuel their power plants and heat plants through the summer. So, so clearly the universities and municipalities are potential beneficiaries. I think we're at the end, Sarah. Yeah, if there are any final questions, uh, please type them in the chat pod. I guess at this point, um, you know, if you have any, any questions, type them in. But in the meantime, uh, Jim, is there anything you want to leave us with today? Any final thoughts to, to kind of summarize what we've talked about? Yeah, thanks again to Penn State and USDA for supporting this new bio series. Uh, I followed, actually have followed some of the videos that are on YouTube. Uh, and found them entertaining. So when Sarah contacted me, uh, we readily accepted doing this webinar today. Uh, and, and hopefully by seeing that you can bale woody biomass uh, at all and potentially bale switchgrass and some of the other ag crops to very high densities, uh, that's introduced you to some new possibilities uh, to figure into what is going forward. Uh, in that the reality is that biomass power, biomass advanced biofuels isn't five years away. It's, it's very near on the horizon or in some communities upon us. So bailing is part of the solution. We hope to have these commercially available relatively soon. Thank you all for attending. Thank you, Jim. Yeah, it's great to have uh, some of these presentations that really focus on the logistics issues, which is such a major piece of the puzzle, just as important as conversion technologies and in feedstock development, certainly. So uh, so we very much appreciate your input. And uh, this is really interesting stuff, and we look forward to the commercialization of these balers. <laughs>